The battle over copyright laws between the internet and large media corporations has been raging for well over a decade. Although the RIAA and its cohorts managed to score a major victory with the destruction of Napster, in its wake, many more imitators popped up. As the 2000s went on, it became clear that these corporations would have to go higher up to get their way. They had to get the government involved and lobby for legislation. And thus began the disaster of out-of-touch old people, probably less technologically inclined than your grandma who asked you how to turn her computer on, finding themselves with the power to potentially destroy the greatest technological advancement of our lifetimes. The internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's, it's a series of tubes. You're probably aware that in Europe, a piece of legislation known as Article 13 was recently passed. This law, often referred to as the meme ban, has the power to potentially cripple absolutely any website with user-submitted content. And it wasn't that long ago that the United States almost suffered the same fate. So in this episode of Tales from the Internet, let's take a look at the US's original versions of Article 13, SOPA and PIPA. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. After the news of Article 13 being passed came out, a lot of you started to hit me up asking for my NordVPN code. It's no secret that NordVPN can help you access region lock content that is one of your greatest tools in the fight against online censorship. And NordVPN's encryption can also keep your data safe on both your computer and your mobile devices. Just go to nordvpn.com slash wang for 75% off a three year deal and use code wang for an extra month. Stop all the downloading! Think of all of your older relatives that you've had to help with really simple computer stuff. It's not that they're dumb or anything like that, it's that everything they knew about how the world works changed practically overnight. Now imagine that those same relatives were in a position to change how the internet works, and that they're a billion dollar corporation spending as much money as they can to convince them to do things that would break the internet, and I don't mean in the Kim Kardashian's ass kind of way. Companies who would do anything to regain their stranglehold on distribution and become gatekeepers once again. And that's how we find ourselves in this predicament. I mean, think about it. In deciding Article 13, 13 MEPs press the wrong button. Look at this thing. There's three brightly colored buttons that literally look like a Fisher-Price baby toy, and they couldn't figure that out, but somehow they think they could figure the internet out. These people were given the power to fuck everything up, and so they did. But that being said, Article 13 really wasn't anything new. It was the latest iteration of many before it. And throughout the years, there's been many different variations of bills trying to restrict content on the internet, whether it be think of the children type stuff, like what I covered in my Two Girls One Cup video, or net neutrality, which is a highly connected but somewhat distinct issue. And today I want to focus on two of the earliest ham-fisted attempts at enforcing copyright law online. Because the way that these pieces of legislation parallel Article 13, it's kind of like in Final Destination, avoiding your death only to find out you still gotta die. You're fucked. So let's turn the clock back several years. It was on May 12, 2011 that a bill called the Protect IP Act, or PIPA, was introduced by Democratic Senator Patrick Lee of Vermont. Months later, on October 26th of 2011, a similar bill named the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA, was introduced by House Republican Lamar Smith. Both bills were practically identical, and both bills received bipartisan support. They also received strong support from the MPAA, the RIAA, pharmaceutical companies, and television networks such as NBC. The goal of these bills, as they put it, was to block access to rogue websites dedicated to infringing or counterfeit goods. And these sites would be cut off by DNS blocking, a concept that critics compare to China's Great Firewall. Additionally, these infringing sites would be cut off from payment processors and from advertisers. And although there's obvious concerns with this of censorship and anti-competitive practices, it may seem like this isn't that bad on the surface. 
after all, copyright needs to be protected. You can't just throw your hands up in the air and say everything's free now or entire industries will crumble. But the major problems with this bill were in the language and in the implementation. For instance, a site could be blocked just for linking to infringing content, which would put any site with user submitted content at risk. Or even a search engine like Google for merely indexing a site that had infringing content. And it would also circumvent the DMCA's safe harbor provisions. And I'm sure the mention of the DMCA might make your skin crawl if you're aware of it, but the safe harbor provisions are actually really important for the internet to function the way that it does. Essentially, they prevent a website from being penalized for copyrighted content as long as they're making a good faith effort to get rid of it. If I were to upload the entire Star Wars series to YouTube and they were to get a DMCA takedown notice and they were like, fuck it, YOLO, and they just left it up, they would get in trouble. But if they comply with the request and take it down, no matter how long it was up beforehand, it's all good. And granted, despite this, YouTube's copyright claim system is completely broken, but that's a whole other can of worms. By circumventing these important provisions, SOPA and PIPA would have made websites liable regardless of whether or not they knew the infringing content was there. And with the sheer volume of content uploaded at any given moment, even back in 2011, uh, there's just no way to reasonably make sure there is nothing there. So that means that if implemented, these bills would mean the end of user submitted content and a return to a world where the only things you can watch are Disney and NBC and whatever bullshit these companies put out. And on top of all of this, there was also a provision that would put infringers in prison for up to five years. And it was that specific provision that led to one of the first acts of online protest against SOPA and PIPA. A website called freebieber.org. It was created by the group Fight for the Future and focused on how Justin Bieber made his career doing cover songs. And because of how these bills worked, it's likely that instead of performing in front of massive crowds, he'd be sitting behind bars. And that might sound like a bit of a stretch, but consider that it wasn't that long ago that Jack Septicai received a claim for merely jokingly singing Hooked on a Feeling to himself. Watch me get claimed for daring to utter the words, hooked on a feeling. At this point, awareness of the issue started spreading rapidly through the internet and various websites and online communities started taking notice of it. And on November 16th, coinciding with the beginning of the congressional hearings on this matter, over 6,000 websites including 4chan, Reddit, Tumblr all joined in on an event known as American Censorship Day. On American Censorship Day, these websites blocked parts of their websites to simulate a censored internet and gave links on how to fight against these bills. They also co-authored a letter to Congress printed as a full-page ad in the New York Times. We stand together to protect innovation. November 15th, 2011. Dear Chairman Leahy, Ranking Member Grassley, Chairman Smith, and Ranking Member Conyers, the undersigned internet and technology company's right to express our concern with legislative measures that have been introduced in the United States Senate and the United States House of Representatives, S-968, the Protect IP Act, and H.R. 3261, the Stop Island Piracy Act. We support the bill's stated goals, providing additional enforcement tools to combat foreign rogue websites that are dedicated to copyright infringement or counterfeiting. Unfortunately, the bills as drafted would expose law-abiding U.S. internet and technology companies to new and uncertain liabilities, private rights of action, and technology mandates that would require monitoring of websites. We are concerned that these measures pose a serious risk to our industry's continued track record of innovation and job creation, as well as to our nation's cybersecurity. We cannot support these bills as written and ask that you consider more targeted ways to combat foreign rogue websites dedicated to copyright infringement and trademark counterfeiting while preserving the innovation and dynamism that has made the internet such an important driver of economic growth and job creation. One issue merits special attention. We are very concerned that the bills as written would seriously undermine the effective mechanism Congress enacted in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act (DMCA) to provide a safe harbor for internet companies that act in good faith to remove infringing content from their sites. Since their enactment in 1998, the DMCA's safe harbor provisions for online service providers have been a cornerstone of the U.S. internet and technology industry's growth and success. While we work together to find additional ways to target foreign rogue sites, 
we should not jeopardize a foundational structure that has worked for content owners and internet companies alike and provides certainty to innovators with new ideas for how people create, find, discuss, and share information lawfully online. We are proud to be part of an industry that has been crucial to U.S. economic growth and job creation. A recent McKinsey Global Institute report found that the Internet accounts for 3.4% of GDP in the 13 countries that McKinsey studied, and in the U.S., the Internet's contribution to GDP is even larger. If Internet consumption and expenditure were a sector, its contribution to GDP would be greater than energy, agriculture, communication, mining, or utilities. In addition, the internet industry has increased productivity for small and medium-sized businesses by 10%. We urge you not risk either the success or the tremendous benefits the internet has brought to hundreds of millions of Americans and people around the world. We stand ready to work with the Congress to develop targeted solutions to address the problem of foreign rogue websites. Thank you in advance for your consideration. But despite this massive coalition of websites and internet companies uniting against these bills, there is one major outlier. An outlier that actually wrote its own letter in support of these bills. That company was the domain name provider, GoDaddy. It was an extremely long statement outlining the company's history and their reasoning for supporting it, but it could be best summed up with this section. Our support for SOPA. GoDaddy has a long history of supporting federal legislation directed toward combating illegal conduct on the internet. For example, our company strongly supported the Ryan Height Online Pharmacy Consumer Protection Act of 2008, the Protect Our Children Act of 2008, and the Preventing Real Online Threats to Economic Creativity and Theft of Intellectual Property Act of 2011, Protect IP. GoDaddy has always supported both government and private industry efforts to identify and disable all types of illegal activity on the internet. It is for these reasons that I'm still struggling with why some internet companies oppose Protect IP and SOPA. There is no question that we need these added tools to counteract illegal foreign sites that are falling outside the jurisdiction of US law enforcement. And there is clearly more that we could all be doing to adequately address the problems that exist. Although this statement was written in November, it went by unnoticed until a Reddit user named Self Prodigy brought it to everyone's attention in December. I just finished writing GoDaddy a letter stating why I'm moving my small business's 51 domains away from them, as well as my personal domains. I also pointed out that I transferred over 300 domains to them as a director of IT for a major American company. I'm suggesting December 29th, as move your domain away from GoDaddy Day because of their support of SOPA. Who's with me? And as it turned out, a lot of people were with him. This single post caused a massive groundswell of backlash against GoDaddy. Companies such as BuzzFeed, the Cheeseburger Network, Wikipedia all stated their intentions to remove their business from GoDaddy. And as this boycott ramped up and it was receiving more and more news coverage, GoDaddy decided to withdraw their support. Fighting online piracy is of the utmost importance, which is why GoDaddy has been working to help craft revisions to this legislation, but we can clearly do better. It's very important that all internet stakeholders work together on this. Getting it right is worth the wait. GoDaddy will support it when and if the internet community supports it. But despite their change of heart, the boycott went on as planned and GoDaddy wound up losing over 70,000 domains. To this day, their name is still severely tarnished. The SOPA hearings would continue on December 15th of 2011. During these hearings, some of the most commonly heard phrases were, I'm not a nerd and I'm not a tech expert, but despite none of these people being nerds or tech experts, they didn't hear from a single nerd or tech expert that day. They did, however, hear from a number of lobbyists speaking on behalf of the companies that supported the bill. They also took the time to discuss pizza. I welcome the gentleman to uh, come over to the uh, offices on the majority side. He is welcome. Uh, to partake of three different kinds of pizza. Are you providing three types of pizza, pizza for the minority too? The answer is yes. I, 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 appreciate, I, was, I appreciate the chairman's even-handedness. Uh, Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Uh, Mr. Watt reports four different kinds of We may have made a mistake there. And argue about tweets. I'm reading a tweet that is going out from GOP Rep King. I do think it's inappropriate while we're talking about serious issues to have a member of the Judiciary Committee be so offensive. So 
I'm putting on the record he is not here. <coughs> um, I, Chairman, I demand the gentlewoman's words be taken down. Well, I'm not taking them down, so you can break this hearing because I'm not. I'm the suspended. gentleman from Wisconsin will state the words he wishes to be taken down. I wish to have the words taken down where the gentlewoman said that Mr. King of Iowa was being offensive. All in all, this hearing was a several hour long circus that basically just revealed how little the elected officials knew about either the internet or copyright law itself. In fact, it was later revealed that Lamar Smith, the man who made SOPA, was a copyright infringer himself. Vice Magazine published an article that revealed that Smith had taken a photo and used it on his website without permission from the photographer. Meaning that if SOPA were to pass, Lamar Smith could very well be Justin Bieber's cellmate. But despite the very obvious ignorance of all these government officials, a vote was slated for January of 2012. And as that vote, which would determine the fate of the free internet, came closer, a plan to save the internet began to hatch. It began when Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, put out a statement on his user talk page asking for the community's opinions on protesting by blacking out Wikipedia. I thought this would be a good time to take a quick reading of the community feeling on this issue. To be clear, this is not a vote on whether or not to have a strike. This is merely a straw poll to indicate overall interest. If this poll is firmly opposed, then I'll know that now. But even if this poll is firmly in support, we'd obviously go through a much longer process to get some kind of consensus around parameters, triggers, and timing. As support for Wales' idea grew, there were rumors that more internet companies wanted to join in on this so-called nuclear option. As Declan McCullough put it on an article on CNET, Web firms may be outspent tenfold to lobbyists, but they enjoy one tremendous advantage over the SOPA backing Hollywood studios and record labels, direct relationships with users. How many Americans feel a personal connection with an amalgamation named Viacom? Compared with voters who have found places to live on Craigslist and jobs or spouses on Facebook and Twitter, how would, say, Sony Music Entertainment, one of the Recording Industry Association of America's board members, cheaply and easily reach out to hundreds of millions of people? It was on January 10th of 2012, a day in which the hashtag BlackoutSOPA was trending, and Twitter users were blacking out their profile pictures in protest, that Reddit officially announced that this nuclear option was happening. The freedom, innovation, and economic opportunity that the internet enables is in jeopardy. Congress is considering legislation that will dramatically change your internet experience and put an end to Reddit and many other sites you use every day. Internet experts, organizations, companies, entrepreneurs, legal experts, journalists, and individuals have repeatedly expressed how dangerous this bill is. If we do nothing, Congress will likely pass the Protect IP Act in the Senate or the Stop Online Piracy Act in the House, and then the President will probably sign it into law. There are powerful forces trying to censor the internet, and a few months ago, many people thought this legislation would surely pass. However, there's a new hope that we can defeat this dangerous legislation. We've seen some amazing activism organized by the Redditors at r SOPA and across the Reddit community at large. You have made a difference in this fight, and as we near the next stage, and after much thought, talking with experts, and hearing the overwhelming voices from the Reddit community, we have decided that we will be blacking out Reddit on January 18th from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. EST. And Jimmy Wales would announce that Wikipedia too would black out. Free speech includes the right to not speak. We are a community of volunteers. We have written this thing that we believe to be a gift to the world. We don't charge people for it. It's freely available to anybody who wants to use it. We are a charity. And I think it's important for people to realize that the ability of our community to come together and give this kind of gift to the world depends on a certain legal infrastructure that makes it possible for people to share knowledge freely. That the First Amendment is incredibly important in terms of the creation of this kind of thing. And when that day came and Alex Ohanian testified in front of Congress, over 100,015 websites blacked out. This was unlike anything the internet had ever seen before. Everything was dragged to a screeching halt, showing what the internet may very well be like were this legislation to pass.
And because of this, millions of emails were sent to Congress people by their constituents stating their opposition to SOPA and PIPA. And it was Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, one of the key opponents of these bills, who cited petitions with over 13 million names in opposition to them. Things were looking bad for SOPA and PIPA, but the legislation's supporters were not impressed. The MPAA has taken notice of the many websites blacking out their content today in protest of SOPA, and thinks these companies would be better off supporting efforts to combat piracy rather than protesting. Chris Dodd, former senator and current MPAA CEO, starts his statement under the guise of concern, saying sites participating in Blackout Day, such as Reddit and Wikipedia, are irresponsible and resorting to stunts that punish their users. He goes on to say that these blackouts are a dangerous and troubling development, and an abuse of power given the freedoms these companies enjoy in the marketplace. Closing with a bit of you're with us or against this rhetoric, Dodd says that this blackout is designed to punish elected and administration officials who are working diligently to protect American jobs from foreign criminals. Apparently, Dodd wants support in combating piracy from these sites. No protests. If that's the case, he's fishing for that support in an awfully strange way. But thankfully, there was little the MPAA or any of the other companies supporting these bills could do. The sponsors of these bills, realizing what a disaster they had on their hands, began to withdraw their support one by one. And on January 20th of 2012, Senator Harry Reid announced that the vote on PIPA was cancelled. And on that same day, Representative Lamar Smith withdrew his support for SOPA, effectively killing the bill. This was a massive victory for internet freedom. The heavily moneyed interests of the old media were waging an attack on the new media, and websites and internet users joined together to stop it. But that's not where the story ends. Versions of these bills would continually re-emerge over the years, such as being baked into trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or ACTA. And hacked emails from the MPAA revealed continuous efforts to keep pushing this kind of legislation. And now at this point, the passing of the EU's new copyright directive, which includes Article 13, which for some reason has been changed to Article 17, is the biggest blow yet against internet freedom. It's a piece of legislation that's very similar to SOPA and PIPA, except Instead of DNS blocking, companies would be held financially liable for failure to prevent the uploading of copyrighted material. And there's a few different ways that they could possibly deal with this. The first being to just simply cut off the EU completely. That's a horrifying but probably unlikely scenario. Another way to solve this is to manually review every single piece of content that gets uploaded, which there's just too much of it and not enough people to ever possibly do that. The third and most likely solution is really strong content filters, and if you've noticed anything about Google's content filters, which at this point are the best in the business, they're still not very reliable. And even though Article 13-17 allows for fair use, how can the AI possibly discern what is and isn't fair use? That's why they call it the meme ban. But interestingly, it's actually the de facto need for filters that might be our way out of this mess. According to Danny O'Brien of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, we can expect media and rights holders to lobby for the most draconian possible national laws then promptly march to the courts to extract fines whenever anyone online wanders over its fuzzy lines. The directive is written so that any owner of copyrighted material can demand satisfaction from an internet service, and we've already seen that the rights holders are by no means united on what big tech should be doing. Whatever internet companies and organizations do to comply with 27 or more national laws, from dropping links to European news sites entirely, to upping their already oversensitive filtering systems, or seeking to strike deals with key media conglomerates, will be challenged by one rights holder faction or another. But there's also opportunities for the courts to rein in the directive, or even throw out its worst articles entirely. One key paradox at the heart of the directive will have to be resolved very soon. Article 13 is meant to be compatible with the older e-commerce directive, which explicitly forbids any requirement to proactively monitor for IP enforcement, a provision that was upheld and strengthened by the ECJ in 2011. Any law mandating filters could be challenged to settle this inconsistency. 
So although the passing of this copyright directive is a terrible thing, in the two years we have before EU countries need to implement the rules, there could be a way out. So despite how bad this might look, as I record this video, I can't help but be a little bit optimistic that it's not over yet. But just in case, you know, nordvpn.com slash wine. And anyway, if you like this video, check out my video on Napster vs Metallica, which in many ways is the genesis of this whole situation. Bye bye.